Always a pleasure to welcome Matt Brandy Berry of From Ashes to New, in particular when there is new stuff to talk about. And Matt, before uh, we get into the uh, specific songs on the record, I think what you need to do is sort of frame the um, subject matter and where it springs from, because it uh, it harkens back to previous work. Yeah, so, you know, we wanted to do something cool with this record that we hadn't done before. We've heard other bands have kind of toyed around with this idea, and you always hear like things like, like Pink Floyd, like every album's a story and, you know, things like that. So we wanted to turn it um more into like a cinematic piece so you have the music but you also have the art and you have the story so our first album was day one and that was had a post-apocalyptic feel to it um the music the art direction some of the uh, subject matter the songs um and what we wanted to do is we wanted to return to what we call the best possible versions of ourselves musically and in doing so we also wanted to do it with art so going back to our roots in the way that we write music um we thought it would just be fitting to also do that and include it in the story and what a lot of people don't know is we did that with our second record and our third record as well so it's all been a story so the future day one the future and then panic panic was the setup and now we're here at blackout which is the beginning um before day one so the art on day one is a kid sitting on a brand new planet while his planet is exploding in the background and the art for Blackout is the kid on that planet as it's turning into Armageddon. You are well versed at creating songs. I think you probably mm -hmm. need a bit more help and guidance when it comes to all of the other art that goes with a release like this. So tell me about how you deal with all of the other artisans who are brought in to create this vision for you. Um. So I am a firm believer in too many cooks in the kitchen. And <laughs> I think that art, you know, art's subjective, right? And I think that if you are an artist, um, it's because art is what you do. So for me, I like to, in the band, we like to give the, the artist kind of uh, an overall idea of what we're going for, but then let them run with it and kind of just let them use, you know, their creative juices to figure out what they they think you know like for example blackout what they think blackout is um and then you know we kind of just riff back and forth kind of like creating a song we riff back and forth until we land on something and and uh you know the artists that we've been working with uh, from the beginning and until now they always knock it out of the park you get a different sort of uh sense of satisfaction or a different kind of thrill when you see completed artwork come in as opposed to hearing a completed song um, yeah, I think so, because, you know, when you're creating a song, you kind of already have an idea of what it's going to sound like when it's finished. And that that's the idea of going in and creating the song when, you know, like myself, like I can't draw stick figures correctly. You know what I mean? So so when you're, you know, like like me, when you have an idea artistically and you're visualizing this art in your head, but you have no way of being able to flush it out other than telling someone else to do it for you um it's really exciting when they're able to bring that idea to life do you actually and and i know people who do this do you create stick figure pictures or anything to to give people a ju just the the barest sense of guidance to get things going we have in the past i but again i feel like that kind of muddies the waters um especially when you when you get it back and it's almost just like an actual representation of your stick figure drawing so, um, so, you know, again, I just think it's better to kind of just say, hey, this is what the album is. This is what we're talking about. Or this is the song or this is the idea. Let's see what you got. And then just go from there. I think, I think it just seems to work out a lot better that way. Then, of course, your videos through the years, uh, some of them have sort of hearkened into the uh, the world or worlds that you've created. Have you ever thought you could take all of this stuff and put it together into some sort of long form visual presentation, like a short movie or uh, anything like that? It would be fantastic. I mean, that would be a really cool thing to do. Um, we've tried with the most recent things to keep them all with the same subject matter, visual effects and, and, and vibe in the past. Like the hard thing is, is 
is, you know, coming up as a young rock band, um, the budgets just really aren't there for those types of things. You know what I mean? And it costs a lot of money to really flush out those visuals. Um, but we're finally at a place where we can do that. And we're starting to really dive into the art and get lots of really reputable artists involved and, 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 and bring those to life. So that is the, that is the goal moving forward because it all, it is all one big story. So, um, yeah, you know, just look forward to it. Is there anything that you would look towards for inspiration if you were going to do something long form? For example, when I think about you fleshing this out as a project, uh, I, I think it would work great. Have you ever seen Love, Death, and Robots on Netflix? I have not, actually. That sounds interesting. It is absolutely one of the uh, the coolest things ever in cable history. Let me ask you, are you familiar with Heavy Metal Magazine, the, the sci-fi comic book magazine? I am, yes. Well, they made a couple of films through the years, and Love, Death, and Robots grew out of a desire to do a third film it didn't come together as a heavy metal movie. So they created this sort of anthology series for Netflix with each one, a standalone episode by different artists, different stories, dude, you will lose your mind for it. And I think you will probably find it really inspirational for the kind of stuff that you create. I'm gonna check it out, man. You know, I, one of the things that I talk about a lot when we're like creating art, like a lot of the stuff that we do is post-apocalyptic, right? And we don't necessarily tie that into our imagery as a band, except for as of late, we've got this more modern post-apocalyptic vibe to what we do live. And um, But every time I'm talking to an artist about something, I'm like, think Book of Eli, you know, because Book of Eli is so great. And the movie's so great. And the way that the coloring in the movie or like Mad Max, um, you know, stuff like that. I'm like, think that coloring. I think Mad Max actually won awards for the cinematography in that film. I think they won tons. And it's just because... You know, the setup, the costumes, the coloring, like everything that they had is exactly what I think fits the vibe of what we're trying to do. So, yeah, I'm going to check out what I'm going to check that out. man. You know, I, I find myself watching a lot of the the same films and, and television shows that you often bring up. And and sometimes I'm like, the future looks really fucking bleak at this point <laughs> to most people, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 dude. That's what I was saying about, like, you know, when we created day one and we released it, of course, like, you know, we were fresh on the scene. And then a lot of things ended up happening like in the world politically and, and, and whatever. And people were like, wow, that was really prophetic. And then the future again, and then panic, people were like, wow, you really panic. Like you created that before panic. Like how did that happen? And I'm like, I don't know, man, but if blackouts prophetic, we're in trouble. <laughs> like We're in a lot of trouble. Yeah. There was a recent story about getting memories from your parents and your grandparents before they die. So they could be fed into a, an AI program so you could talk to them after they're dead. And I'm like, oh. wait, wait a minute. This was, this was an episode of black mirror and yeah, it was not this. like a good thing. You know, stop this nonsense now. Just let's go back to the mid nineties. You know, I'm, I'm good. I'm good there. Let's go back right at the peak of everything. Now, again, with, with all of these things, with all of these great ideas that, that go into both the individual songs and, and the song cycles that make up, albums how do you take all of these things but still make them catchy tunes you know they, they they've they still got to rock and they, they still got to have hooks how do you turn this stuff into you know awesome music yeah, that's the hard part right because you got the syllable count the syllable count really you know it, it really puts a, a confine around what you're able to do in a song right because you have to make it you have to make the song you have to make it catchy and you can't it can't be 800 words in a chorus or you're not going to be able to sing along to it. So, so it is, it is a difficult task. Um, and I think it's a difficult task to make it subject matter that a lot of people can relate to as well. Cause we try and keep things as open-ended and not as, uh, I guess, pointed as possible. So um, it's hard, but you know, I feel like we do all right with it. We got, we got a, a lot of great artists in the band and the producers we work with. So um Every process, every songwriting process is fun. And I think that's the most important part. And that's that's how you make it catchy is if you're having fun with it, um, it's good. If you're not, I mean, it's like everything in life. If you're not having fun with it, stop doing it. Let's talk specifically about Hate Me Too. It's a tune I was thinking about for uh, Mental Health Awareness Month uh, and uh, how toxic relationships can really batter one's psyche down. T tell me about the uh, creation of the tune. Yeah, I mean, you know, we wanted to write a song about exactly what you just said and the, the relate the toxic relationship where you're in it and you 
just don't leave it for whatever reason. You either feel like you're trapped or you feel like, you know, the grass isn't greener on the other side, or you've just been in it so long that you just feel like, you know, you're comfortable with the abuse or, you know, or vice versa. And we wanted to create a song about how, you know, I hate you and you should hate me too. Like we should hate each other, but for some reason we're still here. And uh, it always goes back to Dane Cook is one of my favorite comedians um, of all time. Just, he was my era comedian. And, uh, you know, he had this joke where he was talking about how girls never leave that toxic guy. And then their friends are always like, Sarah, you got to leave him. And she's like, you know, it's not that easy. My CDs are in his truck. Like there's always like some, some excuse as to why you can't get out of this toxic scenario. And that's what this song is. You know, that's every time I think about it, I think about like Sarah's CDs are in dude's truck and she can't leave because his CDs are there, you know? So, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, we, we wanted to paint that picture. I know that that song, that, that idea has been done by artists in the past, but I, I don't think that there's been a song that's really kind of painted it. Like there's always a song that's like, I hate you or you hate me, but let's create a song about how we hate each other. Is it ever weird having audiences anthemically sing back lyrics <laughs> like that to you? You know, that was that was also part of the idea. No, it's not weird. That was actually part of the idea as well. It was like, you know, this is a really touchy subject. And a lot of people are going through a hard time with this. And it really is kind of just a crappy, crappy thing. So why don't we make it sound happy? So we we uh we took really somber lyrics, upsetting lyrics, and uh, we made them sound as happy as we possibly could. And it's got to be sort of therapeutic for you to be able to get stuff like this out, as as I believe it to be therapeutic for the audience to to scream out lyrics like that in mass. We've all been there, I think. And if not, you will be. Um, and if you found your perfect person, there are people I'm sure that found their perfect person at the you know young age of. 17 or 18 have been together since I've heard the story. Um, but I don't think the majority of us are in that story. So uh, so we've all been there or are going to be there. So it's definitely cathartic to be able to go, you know what, I remember that chick, you know, for me, you know, specifically, I remember that chick, I hated her. She hated <laughs> me too. We hated each other and we stayed together for way too long. What is it like when songs like that that are deeply personal and and maybe personal about unpleasant things what is it like when you meet a fan and they start pouring their heart out to you based on the shared thoughts from a tune like that i think it's i think there's a lot of mixed emotions there i think that you know for one i'm grateful that our music is you know is striking a chord and and it's touching people in a way that they're using it as, you know, um, a coping mechanism in their own life. Like, I love that. Um, I love that about music. I love that about creating because in reality, 99% of the stuff that we create is personal to me as well. Like you just said. So, you know, knowing that we all come or all cut from the same cloth is reassuring that, you know, that we're not as divided as we seem these days. So that makes me happy. I think the other side of it is, 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 uh, you know, I am, an empath so like i feel other people's pain in a way that when i hear it it's like it kind of like it's almost like a dagger you know so it's like i don't know how many times i can hear it before i'm like oh man all right i need to go decompress somewhere so you know there's there's two sides to every coin and i think that's both sides to the coin but i think overall um i'm just grateful and and, and love that our music uh, is out there and people relate to it the way that they do how do you handle it when you meet a fan who obviously is is well meaning and thinks the world of you and the band and your songs? So they're all too excited to see you. Like how, how do you how do you calm it down so you can get a human moment? I I don't know, man. I, I guess I just have this way. My wife says it all the time. She's like, you just have a way with people. I, I don't know what it is, but like, you know, you can hold a conversation with someone for hours. And then, I mean, I don't know. I guess that I'm just genuinely excited as well to talk to people so i think that when you put those two sides together of excitement it creates some sort of you know calm center really like it comes together like this just energy crashing together and the next thing you know you're just having this calm conversation and uh i guess i'm just blessed with that energy man so it's really really no big deal i enjoy talking to people as long as as long as you're not spitting in my face don't spit in my face i don't dig that too much but uh you know, if you got good breath and you're not spitting in my face, we're good to go. We can talk forever. Has it been that way your whole life? Because when I was a little kid, I, I never had problems or any fears 
about going up and meeting or talking to, and I mean, since I'm like four or five years old and, and also animals always really liked me, which I, I found one of the great blessings in life. H has it been like that for you? Was it always easy for you to talk to people since you're little? Yeah. Yeah. My dad's, my dad's, he's actually way more eccentric than I am. So I think that I've got a little bit of what he has. I'm glad I don't have all of it. God love my dad. Love my dad more than anything, but, but but man, he, you have to kind of like break away from him sometimes. Like, all right, man, I got, you know what I mean? So, so I got, I got a, a piece of what, what he has and, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that I do because I'm not sure that I'd be able to do what I, I do for a living. And I also worked in the service industry for years before this. So I was always in customer service. So I'm always face to face with people. So I, I guess, yeah, I've just been comfortable there for forever. You know, a lot of people through and forget your rock and roll stuff, just working in customer service, which I did as a kid uh, as well. There's a lot of people who are just plain nuts, aren't there? Yeah, yeah, there are a lot. But at the same time, like I think every everyone's got their own um, quirks. Right. And like I think everyone's kind of nuts in their own way. Um, and as long as it's not like a malicious type of nuts, I'm cool with it. I think it's I think it's great, like because life's life's you know, it's an exciting mystery, really. And, you know, kind of navigating that is is the fun about it, right? And when, when you meet people that you've never met before and they're eccentric or they're weird or they're quirky, like that to me is like, I don't know, it's fun. So as long as, like I said, as long as they're not malicious and, and, and you know, a pain in the ass, I'm good with it. You mentioned your dad's eccentricity. What's, you know, what's eccentric about your your father? Oh man, he's got the stories. He's got the stories, man. And, uh, and he, you know, it seems like as he gets older, the same story keeps coming out, you know what I mean? But like, uh, um, I don't know. He's, he's kind of like, he's kind of like my Labrador. He's just really excited all the time. And, and it's great to be around because it's such a, it's such a great energy, you know, like someone who's just excitable. Um, but sometimes like, you know, <laughs> I'm going to play the flip side of this coin too. You're not always, you know, I'm not always excited or, you know, everyone else isn't always excited, but he is. So it's like, so when you run into that, that energy that, that never stops, it's like, okay, I gotta, I gotta break away for a hot second. I know that you're really excited, man, but I've got to, I got to go over here for a minute. Um, so yeah, I guess the best way to describe it is, is he's got, he's got great stories, usually about me or family history. Um, and he's like a Labrador retriever, man. He's just happy to see it. Have you ever seen the, uh, the film, and it's it's maybe the great my dad has crazy stories film. Have you ever seen Big Fish? I have once. Yes, I have seen Big Fish. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I I hear you you describing your dad, and that was the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> now, now we we spoke about people being really excited to meet you and the band. Uh, off times, um, has there been anybody, any rock star that you grew up on, or or perhaps maybe a, a filmmaker or a TV person, somebody in in the arts somewhere that you met and you had to keep yourself from freaking out? Um, a lot, honestly. And, and my my freak out's more like I have to keep myself from like turning into a hermit and just running away. Like that's kind of like my freak out is like, don't say anything <laughs> stupid. <laughs> So, but a lot, you know what I mean? Because I grew up um, a fan of the bands that I've toured with and have done festivals with and have been around and, and hung out with. So it's like, you know, Jacoby Shaddix or Ben Burnley or, you know, Mike Shinoda. I mean, I could go down the list for days of artists that I've had, um, you know, Brent Smith, who I'm currently on tour with. You know what I mean? I can go down that list for days, man. Um, and... I, I just, you know, composure. That's the biggest thing, composure. Um, and realize that, you know, we're all doing the same thing. We're all out here for the same reasons. And uh, um, just just take that uh, that early 2000s fan, put it aside for a little bit and go, all right, all right, these are your peers now, man. Calm down. These are, these are your homies. Now, when you do, you know, strike up a friendship, with any of these guys and, and each one of them that you mentioned are, are not only great artists, but awesome human beings. Sure. When you get to talk shop about how they do what they do, be it on or off stage, what are the kind of things that you would bring them up and, and how do you bring them up that it can be done politely in conversation? Um, a lot of times it's sports, man. 
like I'm just, you know, I'm a big sports fan. When, when we toured with Papa Roach in the past, like we were always just throwing football or doing something stupid with, with the football. Um, like, you know, uh, green room, setting up trash cans is like, you know, you got to throw it from across the green room, get in the trash. It's just like always sports, you know, it's, uh, that's one of the, the biggest icebreakers for me. Um, and music, of course, right? Because that's what we're all out here doing. Um, or, or family, you know, we talk family too. So, I mean, it's really, it's kind of just like everyday life, just, you know, behind the scenes of some of the greatest rock shows, you know, that we, we are honored to be a part of. Have you ever seen the gaming setup that the Breaking Benjamin guys often bring out? Um, I know that Ben has got, so he had VR before anyone had VR. And I know yeah. that like when we did the tour with him in 2018, I ran into <laughs> Ben was a hard guy to find because it was it was pretty fresh. And I'm pretty sure he was playing like Skyrim or something at that point. So like he was like MIA. So <laughs> I would run into him every now and then and be like, what's up, man? What, what are you up to? He's like, oh, man, that VR. I'm on that VR. So, <laughs> so you know, I didn't I didn't necessarily see the gaming setup because I think that he kind of had one to his own at that point. So um, maybe if we tour with them again here in the near future, I'll, I'll, I'll get a chance to see what you're talking about. Yeah, you've got to watch for it. I, I I think we were, maybe it was like Evansville, Indiana or something. I walk in and there's like a double-sided, wardro uh, double-sized wardrobe road case. And I'm thinking, oh, it must be guitars. And it was a fucking gaming setup. That's it. They, they would roll it into the dressing room, open it up, screens, headset, like everything ready to go. And, and the guys were like, we're stuck on the road nine months a year. We got to <laughs> yeah, right, do right. something, you know? So Lance, Lance would love that. Lance is the big gamer of the group. Um, I think Lance and Danny are probably more so the gamers. I'm more so like got into reading books. I hope that's not a sign, but I, you know what I, mean? I got into reading books lately. No books are, you know, as my late father used to say, books are the candles that light men's minds. Do you find when you game too much, that you sort of, uh, it takes you a little while to be able to deal with people who are there with you in the room after a while. Does your, does that sort of shut down functions of your brain? Yeah. Yeah. I think I can see what you're saying. I don't game really much at all anymore. So, um, I think I was more so the guy yelling in the, the call of duty lobby, you know what I mean? Like, so, <laughs> so after gaming, hanging out with, with real people was kind of actually, you know, better in a way. Yeah. Um, Cause I'm like, Oh, I can see you and I don't hate you. This is great. Um, but yeah, I don't game as much anymore. You know, when I got into, so I was really big into like, you know, the, the first person shooters uh, more so battlefield than call of duty, but I love them both. Um, but when I got into music creation and like production, cause, cause it's like a big thing of mine is, is producing like, sure. Like I'm a vocalist in the band, but I think one thing that people don't know a lot about me behind the scenes is I do a lot of our production. Um, so when I got into doing that is when I kind of started getting out of video games, it was almost like video games, um, didn't stimulate my brain the way I needed it to be. Right. I didn't get the, I didn't get that, that rush from from video games anymore the way that i would get it from creating music and i just think that creating music is just it's just to me it's like a video game like and you've got to but but you don't have a starting point like there is no starting point not like in a video game where it's like okay start here and you finish here when you create a song there's no starting point there's no ending point you have nothing except for a blank slate and that to me is more interesting i think i'd rather invest my time there and i do i invest tons of my time in the creation of music Quick aside, what books are you reading lately? Oh. <laughs> so uh, I read like positive affirmation stuff and things that uh, talk about the way the brain works and uh, manifestation and things like that. Um, so right now I'm reading, people are going to find this weird. Right now I'm reading a book that's called uh, The Power of Christ Oil. <laughs> and basically it talks about... Um, like the spinal fluid and like the importance of um, different chemicals that your brain creates and like what we as humans don't know about them and um, what we can do with them and what we don't do with them and kind of how those different powers and things that humans are actually capable of doing are, are really kind of hidden from us on purpose through the years and how we can unlock those things and kind of just, um, you know, transcend and reach higher levels. 
That seems really interesting. Of late, I've been reading a lot of the original UFO reports from Operation Blue Book as well as Operation Sign, and it's all this stuff that was recently declassified, and it's like, yikes. Yeah, (laughs) right, right. Well, listen, I can't wait to see you on the road. And you guys, not only with the current tour, you've got a, a million other things in the works. So sort of encapsulate through the end of the year, including the release date for the record. Yeah. Yeah, man. We're excited. I mean, you know, we get the the Shine Down Three Days Grace Tour, Revolutions Live Tour that we just kicked off. I think we're like four dates deep on that, or I'm not, I'm not quite sure, but we just kicked that off. And that's good. That's a big one going throughout the entire United States. And we just announced the... Uh, um in this moment motionless and white tour that we're a part of so that's going to be this summer the record comes out in july we get the hate me to it radio we got a lot of visuals that we're creating and then uh you know we're planning some big stuff for the fall so i mean you know here we are 2023 man who would have thought that it would take three years to get things back in order huh to quote robert de niro and goodfellas it's gonna be a good summer (laughs) let's go man let's go Matt, it's always great to see you, and I will uh, catch you out on the road uh, sooner rather than later, I hope. Hell yeah, man. 